Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all of you tuning in from around the world. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. My name is Luke. I am a producer here at How To Academy, and welcome to what I'm sure is going to be an excellent event. Today, we are joined by John Green, award-winning author of, to list just a few, Looking for Alaska, Paper Towns, and The Fault in Our Stars, with over 50 million copies sold worldwide. Alongside his writing, he has created Crash Course, Blog Brothers, Project for Awesome, Mental Floss, and VidCon, all of which have cemented John as a founding father of using YouTube as a platform for education and community building. Following on from his hit podcast, John's latest book, The Anthropocene Reviewed, is out now. Today, John will be in conversation with Dan Howell, author, presenter, and entertainer whose online videos have literally billions of combined views. Dan is also an activist for LGBT plus causes and mental health awareness with his book, You Will Get Through This Night, A Practical Guide to Take Care of Your Mental Health, becoming a recent Sunday Times number one bestseller. After a 45 minute or so conversation with Dan, John is going to take questions from you, the audience. So please do type any you have in the Q&A function, either at the bottom of your screen or at the top, I think, if you're on iPads. Well, that's more than enough from me. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome John Green and Dan Howell. Gentlemen, over to you. Hello. Bonjour. Hello. Hi there. Members Thanks. of the How To Academy, book fans, nerd fighters and fannies. Uh, yeah, I'm your host, self-centered internet clown Daniel Howell, and here talking with the alive and here John Green, author of The Anthropocene Reviewed. Oh, that's very kind of you to have the book with you, Dan. That's so nice. I do uh, have the book. Really nice to talk with you. It. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for doing this. Thanks to How to Academy. Uh, it's this. Is, I'm really looking forward to this. And but but before we start, and I know that this is about my book. Uh, this this whole conversation is going to be wrestling for control. Um, it is, isn't it? <laughs> we, we, it's just how it's going to be. Uh, I, it has now been a month since your book. Um, you will get through this night has come out, and I have to say that I continue to find this book helpful on a daily basis. Uh, I R refer to it every day, uh, which is very rare. So anyway, it's a really great book. And I, if you haven't gotten it, I'm sure everybody in the chat has gotten it. But if you haven't, you should really check out You Will Get Through This Night. It is exactly what it claims to be a practical guide to improving your mental health. Well, thank you, John. Although you should have said hashtag ad to disclose that I paid you to say <laughs> that um, but that's fine. Well, um, kicking things off, John, what about the football? Am I right? <laughs> I, yeah i mean i was surprised actually i was surprised dan that they scheduled this event for during the uh czech czech netherlands game because i know that it was difficult for you to rip your attention away so from difficult 2021 i would have absolutely been watching that i mean you're joking john but what I did not watch to be here was the Austrian Grand Prix, which is literally the only oh. thing tangentially sport related that I do watch. So that's how much I like you, John. I appreciate the that. The only appreciate related, the vaguely masculine activity that I do watching fast cars go around in circles. I, I'm also a big fan of watching fast cars go around in circles. So that's another thing that yet another thing we have in common. But there's more circles in the Indy 500. So you win that one, True. I guess. Um, I just want to say as a disclaimer before we get into this, that this may be overhyped. I don't know if you read the event page, but it was advertised with the following sentence. And this is not a description of your book. This is a description of the event that you're all a part of now. <clears throat> a profound original and inspiring new take on the meaning of life <laughs> is this event right now um so I've, let's let's do a tldw for anyone with a short attention span or didn't yeah. read about your appreciation of sycamore trees john what's the meaning of life <laughs> uh well, i mean this is something that i that i think about a lot in the book and that i think mm. a lot about a lot in my life because so I, you know, when I talk, I, Hank and I often talk about this because we both feel like you kind of can't do anything unless you know what the meaning of life is. Um, and so, so we're always operating with some meaning of life in our heads. It's just that a lot of times we're operating with like an inherited or some kind of default uh, notion of what the meaning of life is. Uh, and so I'm always reframing it. The answer for me is that I don't know what the meaning of life is, um, but that I uh, and making it up or deriving it from some other source all the time and that it is constantly changing for me. But ultimately, I think that we are here to pay attention. And I also think that we are here to be. 
which I know mm -hmm. is kind of like a cop out on on the meaning of life, but I but I mean it. We are here to to be in community, to be with each other. We are here to be with the universe and with the sycamore tree that is right outside my house providing me shade right now. Um, and so I, I actually think it's quite beautiful and lovely that, that we are here to be. And then the second thing I think we're here to do is to pay attention to try to understand ourselves and the universe um, and, and to be kind to each other. There's this uh, great Philip Larkin poem that's real evidence for the fact that a um, cracked vessel can shine some light. Uh, uh, that goes, uh, we must be careful of each other, we must be kind while there is still time. And I don't know, that contains a lot of the meaning of life for me. While there is still time. Well, thanks, John. I mean, you somehow managed to deliver. So that was a good intro. Goodbye. <laughs> thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for coming. That was it, guys. Um, I mean, I've been living with your book for a few weeks now except I read about 80 pages in one setting and then I immediately stopped because I decided that I wanted to pace it out I think the magic wow. of a book of essays is that you kind of get to break it up and yeah. I decided that I needed that daily prescription of hope and perspective that the essays gave so I just want to say thank you for giving me that and I'm sad that it's over <laughs> well thank you for reading it that way like it's really nice to hear from people who read it that way, um, who like read one essay a day or read it before bed or something, because mm -hmm. I did I did write it to be read that way. Like I wanted there to be an arc to the, you know, a couple arcs really to the overall sort of like structure of the book. But I also wanted each one to live on its own so that it could be its own little uh, message in a bottle, you know, uh, my its own little like dispatch from what it felt to be alive in this little moment. And the process has obviously been quite a long time since you began the broadcast to writing the book and the last thing that you did. And you, you described how it was almost a process of going from hope to despair and then back to hope again from 2019 to 2021, which I think is a quite universal experience for lots of people. And I, it was definitely my experience and I needed that. Where are you on the hope despair spectrum right now? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I, you know, I think these things have to live alongside each other, to be honest with you. So like, I, I want to, I want to answer your question honestly. Um, but I also don't because like anytime, did you watch Bo Burnham's thing? Yes. So thing. Yep. the, one of the many things that I really liked about it is that you can't tell to what extent he's performing and you and I both know that you can't like, I think some people, like some people may watch that and not be conscious of, of the extent to which it's performative, but like mm -hmm. you, people who make stuff online are, are gonna be super conscious of it. And so anytime I ask that question, I, or anytime I think about that question and I'm talking about it in public, I, 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 I don't wanna answer all the way honestly, to be honest mm -hmm. with you, because, um, because sometimes I'm like doing really poorly, but it's not anybody's fault and I'm gonna be okay and I don't want people to worry about me. Um, and then other times I'm doing really well, even though like the world is going to shit and it's 135 degrees in Canada and, um, you know, and I, and I feel bad saying like, I'm doing great, like, but the, but the world's falling apart. So I think I, the way I've started to think about it now is that like all of these things have to coexist because if I tell yeah. a story that I'm doing awesome and life is great and it's kick, kittens and rainbows, like that's not that's never going to be the whole truth uh but also like if i if, if even when i'm feeling intense despair that is also never the whole truth like in fact that's one of the things that i took away from took away from your your book was was the idea that like that 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 more than one thing can be has to be true at the same time and so you've asked me a very simple question that i've answered very poorly uh but the answer is that um you know i've had like i've had a rough a uh, couple few months really mm -hmm. uh, since finishing the book was really, really, really difficult. The most difficult period I've had in my professional life. One of our kids mm -hmm. had COVID, which was uh, scary and stressful. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it was just a, it was just a difficult period. And then also like my mental health wasn't, wasn't where it needed to be to like be able to cope with those stresses. Uh, I, I am doing better now, which is what people always say, but it's <laughs> in this case. Um, 
I mean, I think there's something to the fact that we don't talk about our, our wounds. We talk about our scars kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I, I'm doing better now. Uh, I do feel, I do feel hopeful um, about like the life situation in general. And I think that hope is the correct response to consciousness and, and even to history, but I'm really concerned, man. I see a lot of things to be pretty, pretty worried about on the internet and off the internet. And um, it, it definitely freaks me out a little bit, but I have to let these things live alongside each other on parallel lines, you know? Exactly. Well, I mean, that was an honest answer, firstly. So you did it. Oh, I did. Well I done. got it. You, you, just you did the honest it. answer. I made a huge mistake. <laughs> and you also justified your own point about why it's so necessary to have perspective on all these things, which I mean, is exactly what your book was about. What was the process of creating and specifically writing a book for you during COVID? Because I'm someone that I have no life. I spend all my time inside. Everything I do is just typing on a keyboard on the internet everyone's lives have changed wildly in their circumstance because of this situation but how was the process for creating this different to the novels not in a non-fiction fiction way because of the pandemic yeah it was definitely different because of the pandemic and it changed a lot like as the pandemic hit um in sort of little obvious ways like i had to become my own audio engineer um, but then also in uh, much, much bigger, deeper ways, which is, which I guess would be two things. First, it became impossible for me to write about anything other than the, than the pandemic because I, um, I, I've never had a really healthy relationship with infectious disease. It's always been a site of um, anxiety for me with, with my OCD and um, that got much worse. And so I was coping with it whatever way I could. That was one thing. And then the other thing, um, that, that really, really changed was that my kids were home all the time. They needed support with e-learning. Um, they had a lot of really big, difficult challenges in that process. Um, and so Sarah and I really just had to kind of split up the day. And so my work, the, 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 the work life that I'd grown and accustomed to over the last 20 years, I've had a very kind of lucky work life in that I get to, have, to do the same thing pretty much every day, which is what makes me happy, just like completely and radically changed. Um, obviously, this isn't anywhere close to the, the, the most important losses of the pandemic, but it was my personal one. And so... I had to change the way that I wrote, um, both like literally and figuratively, because I was changing what I was writing about, but I was also changing like the hours I was spending typing. And in a lot of ways that turned out, I think that turned out good for the book because I was writing late at night. I was writing on the weekends. I was writing at 4.30 in the morning because I woke up scared and couldn't think of what else to do. And I found that um, by not having that same set routine, I was able to kind of start to write differently. Like I was able to think about different things that um, that essays could do. Uh, and so like some of the essays in the book that I like the most are the ones that are the least like um, the podcast, like Wintry Mix or um, uh, the essay about plague uh, and, and infectious disease. Um, and those were only possible really because of the, the way I was writing. Well, for those of us, that are in the first world countries that are privileged enough to be exporting and creating vaccines. It looks like there is maybe a horizon in sight to this particular yeah. plague. Do you think, because you know the book in a way it's very timely for the pandemic, but you made your own point that it is it's actually extremely timeless. Do you think that we will remember the precedents from coronavirus for the next one? Because people said we weren't prepared enough for this. Do you think you know that the Anthropocene is gonna learn lessons? I hope so. I hope so. Um, you know, there, 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 for, for, the, for this, I often look to history. And, um, you know, one of the things that we see in history, in, including in recent history, is that when a, so the first thing I'd say is that when an infectious disease stops being a big problem in rich countries, uh, rich countries tend to stop think tend to think that it has stopped being a problem. Mm -hmm. And that is the central reason why 40 million people have died of HIV AIDS. Um, and, and, and we need to, we need to remember that, that that happened because of our collective failure. Um, we had really effective, uh, treatments and interventions to minimize the loss of life associated with HIV AIDS a long time before we began to even try in a meaningful way to implement them. Uh, the second thing I'd say is that 
looking at history, I do see times, many times actually, when in the wake of a severe infectious disease pandemic, people have, uh, there have been big breakthroughs in the ways that we treat and deal with infectious disease and things have gotten a lot better. And that's true with cholera in 19th century Britain. It's true of uh, flu in uh, the, whole, the whole world in the, in the early 20th century. And so I, I do have some hope, but look, the truth is that uh, Part of this has to be, uh, and this is something I talk about in the book too, like immunity is a shared public space. And that's something I took from you, Abyss's brilliant book on immunity. And so um, we, are, as long as there are people who can't access primary health care, as long as there are people who can't um, have their illnesses uh, diagnosed and identified uh, early on in the disease process, we will always be at risk of global disease pandemics. Like this is a, as much a failure of, of pr having inadequate access to primary health care in poor countries as it is anything else. And so I hope that we'll change that. Um, but it's a hard thing to change. It's a big thing to change. It's a big way of different way of thinking about, you know, what the responsibilities of rich countries are to, to impoverished communities. And so we'll see. <laughs> There was so much history in the book, which I thought was a central point of looking back and remembering the knowledge and the passing it forward. How was that different to you in this nonfiction setting, incorporating so much of looking back at, you know, your favorite quotes, things that have happened in the past in terms of trying to tie it into the essays you were writing about your experiences? Uh, it was, that's really natural for me. Like, I really like I mean, the, I, the, one of the things I love about nonfiction is that in, when you're writing a novel, everything has to make sense and like everything has to happen for a reason and the characters have to be motivated by things that are clear and that the reader can comprehend. And when you're writing nonfiction, it just has to be true. And history is full of all these true stories that make absolutely no sense, that are, that are bananas where people behave in wildly irrational ways, including like large communities of people behaving in wildly irrational ways. And so um, I, I, I almost find like history sometimes to be a better model for me in understanding what the hell is going on with myself than I find yeah. fiction to be because uh, I often also behave in ways that I don't understand and things happen to me that I can't comprehend and like I feel like I'm a tiny boat on very high seas and um, and I think that's like a common feeling in history so uh, I, I think because I read a lot of history and I'm, I'm just interested in it and have been interested in it since we started Crash Course 10 years ago like it that part of it was like uh, easier for me than, than a lot of a lot of the other parts. It's a shame that we're not together having this conversation for obvious reasons. Um, but I loved how you described the highway trip as a geographical cure. And in terms of the things that we all miss from, you know, life being able to travel, obviously, it, um, other than appreciating the highway sites, you had a nice time, didn't quite solve the issue. How would you rate geographical cures for your own well-being? What's the importance in your life? They work, man, they work for some people. Like I, I, we have, we have friends when Sarah and I were first dating, we had these two friends and their like relationship was really rocky. And like, mm. they were always just like on the outs and big fights at bars and everything. And then they announced one day that they were moving to Denver. And I was like, classic geographical cure, no chance of success. We all know what this is about. And I saw them like five years ago and they've like completely changed who they are and they like hike up mountains all the time and they're very happy. So I can't say that like the geographical cure doesn't work. I can say that it doesn't work for me because <laughs> um, the problem with the geographical cure for me is that I bring myself with me. And so yep. like the only, the only geographical cure that really works for me is if I'm able to like inhabit a different consciousness for those five days. Mm. Which I'm, ter I'm absolutely horrendously awful at switching off. One of the last holidays I went on with my family was to the Dordogne region in France. And I went there completely and utterly not switched off. And we actually visited, I think it was the Font de Gorme caves, which are kind of like a B tier Lascaux. And they are in fact the, the last cave where you can see polychrome paintings still. Oh. And we, had to wake up at 6 a.m. It's not a tourist, because as you know, they do not want to make it an accessible tourist experience. You have to wake up at 5 a.m., sit on a concrete bench outside the cave in the rain, waiting wow. for an old lady to turn up who will then assess you, look up and down, and decide, based on her schedule, whether she wants to let you in briefly and see the cave, which is entirely fair enough, and I felt like that right, was appropriate. Right. <laughs> and I wish I had read your chapter on it before 
because your perspective on it was wonderful and inspiring in a way I went in and I you know I saw these and it, it it gave me a complete existential crisis because you see these things and your idea of history and human knowledge and how developed we were and how people express themselves the geography of the earth completely different to what I thought seeing rhinos and lions and no yeah. deer and perspectives yeah. and scenes of people and it made me fly home early from the holiday because it freaked me out so much. I told my family, there's a really important meeting. I just have to go back home, sorry, bye. I Googled the nearest <laughs> local airport and I immediately got on a flight and I lied to them and I just left because wow. it, 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 and for me, your moment of, you know, the, the child's handprint on the wall, what that meant to you, beautiful. For me, thinking about the past is very different because I, I don't enjoy my past. Uh, I like to, have all of my clay caves closed to visitors, metaphorically, not in that way. Um, and it was very interesting how you like, well, do you like looking back at your past? Because you you shared all these mountain goats examples of these magical yeah. songs and how it transports yeah. you back. There are places I like going back to. Mm -hmm. um, there are places that are very, very hard for me to go back to and that like I'm, you know, uh, that are really hard. And, but I do think that I feel an urge with the unresolved stuff from my past to understand it and to feel it and engage with it. I've never had that. Um, I've never had that sort of like stereotypically male urge to just like um, push it down or ignore it or, or whatever. Like when I was a kid, my, um, my like parents would always describe me as sensitive. <laughs> 